Hello, friends, and welcome. This is Dory Clark, and we're here with our weekly edition of Better, Newsweek's interview live stream show. We're so glad to have all of you here today, and we are joined by our special guest for the week, John Werner. John is the co-founder of TEDx Boston and a longtime uh, curator of TEDx events. We're going to be talking today about how to give a successful TEDx talk and to learn a little bit more about the TEDx ecosystem, which has become one of the most influential forces in terms of getting new ideas out into the world over the past 10 plus years. John Werner, wonderful to have you. Oh, Tori, it's great to uh, spend time with you. Uh, you make everything better. Uh, I know you've helped some legions of, of people uh, reach their potential, and I'm, I'm excited to dialogue with you and, and help uh, help you have more information that you could share with your, your community, your network, uh, the people that follow you. Thank you so much. And welcome to all of you who are tuning in from around the world. Please go ahead and type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you're dialing in from. Uh, we would love to, uh, to know who you are and also to get your questions for John Werner about how you can break in and the, the, uh, the interesting and mysterious world of TEDx is I have had the pleasure of actually working with John twice in 2014 and then just this past fall, 2021, uh, giving talks for his programs, including one that I, I feel very lucky. John is a terrific uh, curator. And so my most recent TEDx talk, The, Re the Real Reason uh, You Feel So Busy and What to Do About It, actually has now cracked more than 1.1 million views. Uh, you can check it out if you're interested. Uh, go to doryclark.com slash TED, and you can check out that, uh, that information and that talk. But John, the question that I have for you, just as a, as a starting point, can you talk to us about how you actually became a TEDx curator? What, uh, what does that mean exactly? Like, how, how was it that originally, many years ago, you decided to start running local TEDx's, and what was the, the vision at the time? Sure. Um, thanks for asking that. So um, TED, by some uh, metric, is the third most respected media property online. Um, and it's quite an interesting phenomenon. Uh, when it was founded, it was a guy who threw uh, a party and uh, he would have people speak on stage. He asked them not to speak more than 18 minutes. Uh, he said, if I let people speak 20 minutes, they take liberty and go much longer. Uh, today, I think in the TikTok era, that 18 minutes is a lot shorter. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the TED gatherings would happen and Richard Saul Worman, this architect, uh, would curate people, put them on stage, and he would actually uh, um, uh, editorialize the talks right before they were done. And, um, uh, and someone in the audience had raised their hand, said, let me buy the event. And he ended up buying TED and TED uh, uh, stands for Technology Entertainment Design. And the idea was in 1984, when it was founded, to talk across disciplines, which wasn't done a lot uh, back then. Um, Chris Anderson bought it. He had a marketing background, and he did two things that his team said don't do that actually turned out to be really good ideas. One was in uh, 2006, he said, Let, let's put the talks online. He had been going to TV stations trying to get people to um, buy the videos, and no one wanted them. Uh, they didn't know what they were. It was kind of a new format. And uh, he said, well, let's just put them online. A year earlier, YouTube had launched and, and he put six talks online. They all got about a million views pretty quickly, kind of like your talk. And uh, the rest is history. And to date, Ted has produced um, maybe over 2,000 talks around that number. And, um, uh, and people depend on them you know, to, be, uh, to learn lifelong learning, to be inspired. Uh, people forward them and, and so on. Uh, so in 2006, the thing he said he did, Chris did that no one said he should do on his team was give the talks away for free online. Turned out it, it worked out really well. Uh, the second thing he did was in 2000, uh, uh, three years later in 2009, he uh, said let's let's allow local organizers uh, to put an X in front of the word TED and put the geography of their city and town and let them organize their own events and. His initial intent was to have people just show his videos, the 2000 talks that they've produced. He didn't and he want people to sign out uh, lunch rooms and auditoriums. He didn't realize that, that people wanted to curate their own talks, kind of like how I curated you for my stage. And um, uh, so I got one of those licenses. Now, I had I had run a nonprofit. We had raised three hundred million dollars and Larry Summers was our board chair. And I wanted to get the idea 
that the nonprofit stood for, democratizing teaching, getting a second shift of educators to teach. And so I went to a TED conference and TED conference costs the equivalent of like a, a car uh, to attend. It's like uh, $10,000 now. They want you to pay $25,000 and all the money goes to underwrite it so they can give the talks away for free. So I didn't mind going to these events, but at these events, I learned that I can have my own license and, um, uh, and I love the city of Boston and it's been great curating. Um, and for years I would create adventures connected with the talks and the first few speakers that I curated, um, I'd say to them, you know, do you have a field trip that we could do a few weeks before, or a few weeks after your talk? And that was a great way to, uh, uh increase, um, in- engagement, um, so, so I've been doing this for years. I've had over 2,000 talks. I have a few interesting stories about some of the speakers. But did, did I answer your question? Actually, on, this, on the screen, it says how to give a successful TED Talk. Do you want me to just rattle off a few things on that so we can check that one off? Well, we definitely want to get into that. And let me ask you that as a follow-up, John. Let me just uh, interject and say that we are here with John Werner. He is the co-founder of TEDx Boston, which is one of the biggest and most successful TEDx's in the world. And we're so glad to welcome folks from around the world who are tuning in to join us. We want to say hi to uh, Masood, who's joining us. Zulima is in Mexico. Elizabeth is in St. Augustine, Florida. We have a LinkedIn friend from New York City. Monica is in Palo Alto. Allison from Dallas. Rita Marie is tuning in again from Ireland. Demetria from Connecticut. We have a LinkedIn friend from Saudi Arabia. Sushma is back from India. Allison's here. Uh, John Hardan is from England. Roger from Germany. Adnan from Turkey. We've got uh, Lamis Marie from Kuwait. Raul is joining Joining us, Linda uh, Joao from Portugal, Pauline from Santa Fe, Bridget from San Mateo, Richard from Kent, UK, and many more. We're so glad to have all of you. You can put your questions for John Werner into the chat box. We're talking about TEDx's. How do you become a TEDx speaker? How do you make a great talk, etc.? We want to learn more. John Werner, I know that you have uh, an amazing track record. You've curated a lot of talks. Uh, in fact, one of the most popular TEDx talks of all time, uh, Robert Waldinger's talk, which has 40 million plus views uh, came out of your TEDx. So you are uniquely equipped here. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts about what makes for a successful TEDx talk. What do people need to know? Uh, yeah, good question. So when I when I work with people, I, I often start off by saying, who's the audience that you want to communicate with? I think a lot of uh, people who have the opportunity to give a TED talk, and it's the curators of, of the TED events that decide, um, a lot of people use the opportunity to get up and just show off how smart they are. And often that can alienate your audience. And um, what I challenge people to do is think about who do you want to communicate to? A lot of people assume, oh, I need to make the topic accessible to all, all uh, audiences, like, uh, like make it available to anyone, you know, with a, a, a eighth grade education. And, and I, I say, well, you know, maybe think about um, who you really want to target and then think about what you have to offer to them and, and other audiences can, can listen in. So that, that's one thing I say. Um, I also remind people that while uh, uh, the people in the room, when you give the talk is your audience in the, at the moment, the real audience is the internet. And uh, a lot of people get up on stage and try to uh, woo the audience. And, and I remind people that, that the audience is really to show an emotional connection between you and, and when you're giving the talk, uh, when it's online, so you don't seem cardboard or seem uh, like pe- people can't relate to you. And that um, because the audience is the internet, uh, there's a long tail. Some people may find your topic very interesting. And, and sometimes it's not about the multitude of views, but getting to the right people that, that can uh, appreciate the talk or, or activate the ideas in the talk. Um, I also remind people that because it's online, uh, people may tune out and not stay to the end. So you, you may want to have an opening kind of like a James Bond movie where they do the, you know, the big event at the beginning. You may want to put things up front that really draw people in. And I also remind people it's okay to get technical or really into details because people are going to consume this as a video and they, they can kind of pause it and rewatch it. Like often Khan Academies, when people listen to those videos to learn something, they pause and, and rewind. Uh, when people give talks or sermons um, that aren't being recorded, they think about how do I make sure everyone gets it in the moment? But people may be frying eggs and making breakfast as they're watching your, your talk. 
um, and they may, you know, see it in parts and come back later. I also remind people that uh, shorter can can be better. Leave people wanting more. A lot of people want to throw everything in their talk and and show how knowledgeable they are and how many different uh, ways they've thought about the idea. Uh, but I think um, uh, making it, it it clear and um, using humor and self deprecation uh, instead of saying everything you happen to know uh, can can be good. And and I've I've curated a lot of talks. A lot of uh, very famous people, very accomplished people. Some of the most gratifying talks are people that um, that aren't known, and 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 giving them a voice and giving them an opportunity. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. We're here with John Werner. He is the co-founder of TEDx Boston, and we're talking about how to give a successful TEDx talk and learning more about the TEDx ecosystem. If you are enjoying this conversation, if you uh, would like your friends and colleagues to benefit, hit the like button and hit the share button so that they can benefit from it as well. And to make sure you never miss one of our weekly sessions, you can go to doryclark.com. That's me. You can sign up, download a free self-assessment. You will be added to my email list and you'll get reminders for great conversations like this. So you never have to miss one of our sessions. And we also want to say hi to some of the great friends tuning in and joining us. Ellen is here. Doreen is here from Ohio. Mary from Ambler, Pennsylvania. Ellen's here from Chicago. Jeanette from Chile. We have Sepida from Birmingham. We have Masood from Pakistan. Celeste is in South Africa. Michael from New York. Ben is in Chicago. We have a LinkedIn friend from Miami. Diane is back from South Carolina. We have you Yusuf from Birmingham, UK, Charlie from Philadelphia, Nathaniel's joining us back from Austin, Texas. We love having every single one of you. So John, a question that I have, you are regularly curating events. I mean, in fact, sometimes, uh, you know, even more than one in a year. So there's a uh, constant need to be recruiting speakers and you actually have an upcoming event in the fall, the theme of your TEDx Boston is going to be planetary stewardship. Can you talk a little bit about that theme? How did you decide on it? Also the question, um, some TEDx's have a particular theme, some don't. How did you settle on this? And how, if someone aspires to be a TEDx speaker, should they think about uh, fitting into a theme or whether they that might be a possibility for them? Oh, goodness, I am not hearing you right now. Let's see. I do not know why, because you don't appear to be muted, but the sound is not coming through. Yeah, that is, for some reason, still not happening. So not sure what is up, but it may be possible for you to toggle mute on and off. You may need to log out and log back in or possibly try to change the uh, sound. Try can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Amazing. Okay, great. Um, so I, uh, I've i run probably 75 TEDx events to date. And uh, for years, I did it at my, uh, my kids' elementary school. Uh, I would have about 4,000 people come over a weekend. And I would um, have a theater that only held uh, 250 people. I would would have talks there throughout the the, the weekend, and people would mill around the the venue. Uh, sometimes watching on Yogi Bows out in the in the gym, uh, big bean bags. Uh, so I I did that for years. Graham Gunn had designed the school. It was a beautifully designed school. I moved the event to uh, John F. Kennedy Library. I and Pay designed it, beautiful space. And then I went to WGBH, uh, another venue. The the um, great, great space. And then I was kind of creative. I uh, did an event at Fenway Park and I had four speakers speak on the Green Monster. And then I moved the whole uh, operation to uh, behind home plate. And then I moved it again to where the, uh, the pitchers would practice. It was kind of like a movable feast, but for, for TED Talks. And at each of the four uh, spots we moved around Fenway Park, I would have musicians perform. I had an accordion player, like the Elvis of accordion. I had an opera singer behind home plate. I had a, um, a, a virtuoso violinist. So that was kind of creative. I did another event at uh, the Franklin Park Zoo. And uh, I, I moved the tapirs out of their exhibit. Uh, and we were inside the tropical rainforest. And I had George Church, who's like the Einstein of genetics, give a talk. And you could watch George Church by standing right in front of the Tapir exhibit. We moved the Tapirs back. They were actually our last speakers. I just recorded them. Um, 
but you could also go over to the grill exhibit, which was like three or four exhibits over. And I, I simulcast the speakers talks into the grill exhibit. So you could watch the grill as listening to George church. So that, that's just an example of how kind of crazy I've been. I did an event uh, on Martha's vineyard at the Overton house. Uh, and that was the civil rights white house. That's where Martin Luther King wrote a lot of speeches, Malcolm X. That's where a lot of meetings happened during the sixties in this very beautiful Victorian home uh, that important people had met. And, and I wanted to make a statement. We had all African-American speakers at that one, uh, Valerie Jared and uh, Malcolm X's daughter. It, it, it was it was great. Um, so you you said, what am I up to now? So the pandemic happened, and during the pandemic, um, a lot of TEDx's and there's about five thousand licensees out there across the land every day. Uh, TEDx's are happening. Uh, I think people just stopped, and it was it was a tough time. Uh, I think a, a few people did zooms where they did interviews, uh, but that that doesn't really do justice to the the TED Talk format. But I went out and found people um, and recorded them, pre-recorded them and, and did direct to video, kind of like Wonder Woman 84. But uh, I think I never saw that movie, but I heard it wasn't very good. Um, and, and I got a rabbi. I got a, a, a lady in uh, Seattle who never came to Boston, who um, uh, had, had been sexually abused 10,000 times in her life by her dad and, and had a big idea to share, uh, to other victims and, and, and something that I thought was important. So I, I went out and found a hundred talks, uh, and pre-recorded them. And I was kind of wondering like, what, what should I do? And a friend of mine, uh, a neighbor of mine, um, bought this old, uh, social club, McKinney and White and designed it. And she put a few hundred million dollars into it to make it really fancy and nice. And I said, you know what, let me, let me, um, do an event there. And I curated, I had read this book by Mark Bittman, a New York Times reporter for the uh, on food, and I was really moved by it. And I said, hey, well, why don't you come up to Boston and let me interview you or let me have you do a talk? And he said, sure. And then I kind of got carried away. Um, I hadn't been around people in a while. I hadn't done a TEDx in a few months. And I got 72 speakers to speak in one day. I, I said there were all these different blocks, but there really weren't. It was just one continuous uh, event. Actually, you were one of the speakers there. It and, was a uh, very intense and fast paced day. It was incredibly impressive. Yeah. So so I did that event. And then I, I went back to the owners of this social club. I said, well, you know, let's let's do this a few times a year. So let's do it quarterly. And and they said, sure. And um, a few months ago on May 6, I did an event called Epic Strides, and it was all female speakers, and it was celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX um, uh, being passed, and that and was really John, powerful. For, yeah. for folks who are not from the United States, remind, remind us what Title IX is. Yeah, t Title IX uh, was about equal access for women, and, and there was a 36 words, I think, uh, that were written in 1972 that, that uh, uh, allowed, uh, said all any, any universities that got federal funding needed to have equal access for women in all things. And, and the sports arena really, uh, took it up and allowed there to be, uh, opportunities for women to do sports. And, uh, we had some great speakers for that. Um, so, um, coming up, you had mentioned, you know, what am I doing now? I am, um, going to do an event on, uh, on climate change, but uh, I'm going to call it planetary stewardship. And I'm uh, going to do part of it at MIT, get the institute involved, get a, a, a school of higher learning. Uh, I'm going to do it at a museum, uh, the New England Aquarium. Um, uh, and then I'm going to do it at this uh, social club. And kind of like Beverly Hills is taken over once a year uh, by the Oscars. I want to take uh, over Boston um, uh, but instead of being about Hollywood production and who won, I want it to be about ideas, uh, to help, uh, with sustainability on this planet. And I think, uh, you know, people's anxiety, uh, on this issue is, is increasing. And as we learn more and I want to, um, be, uh, be very solution oriented. I don't want to be apocalyptic. You know, there are plenty of people who are pointing out how there's, this is an existential threat. Uh, I want to be the one that, uh, curates uh, ideas that are actionable. Um, and uh, I plan to do this annually in November, a few weeks before Thanksgiving, and um, really excited about the different venues. Um, so it's going to be a multi-day event. And, and I think it's uh, we're going to have um, a real range of people. We already have uh, 55 speakers signed up. And um, I'm excited to make uh, make this something uh, annual. And, and one thing uh, I want to point out is 
while I'm curating the speakers, I also want to curate the audience. Now, in the early days, uh, my first few speakers, I had an astronaut speaking from the International Space Station as she hurled around the international the Earth at 1,800 miles an hour. I I had um, a the number two beatboxer and a Juilliard uh, bassist play. Uh, I've had the future king. I had someone who locked up by pirates. Um, so I've I've spent a lot of time curating speakers. Um, but I also want to curate the audience. I want to curate not just the, the, the people that are going to totally believe in what's going to be said. I want to uh, curate uh, people in the audience who can amplify the ideas or people who are actually maybe some of the blockers of some of these ideas. And in doing so, um, you know, really uh, uh, create an event that, that can help these ideas get, get impact. Uh, some interesting talks that I've curated in the past, I, I tell people, you know, you're going to give the talk of your life. I've had four or five people that were um, on their, uh, had, didn't have much more longer to live, uh, stage four cancer, ALS, uh, give, give talks, and their whole uh, network of friends would come to that, and it was, those were very emotional talks. Um, I had a, a gentleman who had just been made the CEO of a company give a talk and he thanked me for it. And I work with all the speakers. I think some of these thousands of TEDx's, they just tap people kind of like you who are famous and, and thoughtful and say, hey, give a talk. And I go, I make sure I go a step further. I say, you know, I want to uh, do a few sparring rounds with you and hear what you have to say and give feedback and, and uh, you know, take or leave the feedback. But I want to make sure that this isn't some generic talk that you're, you're just giving. And um, so I did that with this one gentleman and, and he said, thank you. This helped galvanize my company. It, it helped me be a better leader, helped me uh, rally my team. And when he hired his chief medical officer, he said, John, can you do what you did for me uh, with him? And I did the same thing and, and it was great. To this day, uh, every new hire in that company has to watch uh, the, those two talks. Uh, and this uh, company is Moderna. Um, and so, you know, you know, Moderna played a key role in, during the pandemic and, and will play a key role. And uh, I feel like in a small way, helping to create a platform for leaders in that company, um, you know, help, help the company go in the direction it's going. Um, there's another speaker who I can tell an interesting story of. Um, the, the first, uh, one of the first programs I did, he came to all the sessions every Wednesday, from nine in the morning to uh, midnight, we would hold these sessions. We did it at the Whitehead in the morning and people would come into their main theater. That's where the human genome was uh, uh, um, decoded. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we would go to the Google uh, offices in, Boston, in, in Cambridge. And this one guy came to all those sessions. He would critique everyone's talk because we would have people pitch. And I was wondering if he was even gonna give a talk. He ended up giving a talk. He was in the uh, latter part of his PhD program that his dad had done. And his dad was a professor at Williams College in biology and his son was getting a PhD in biology. And it was just assumed that he too would become a professor. Um, but I had asked him to give give a talk and and he did and, and ended up going viral and, and he didn't look back. And he's been uh, recording um, videos ever since. And he records science videos uh, on chemistry and biology. And um, a lot of um, people who are in community college when they don't necessarily understand a concept are watching his videos. And uh, he never uh, became that professor. But today, uh, 100,000 people a day watch his videos. And he's had over 100 million views. And uh, he's one of the leaders. This is Tyler DeWitt. And Sal Khan actually reached out to him and said, hey, why don't you come in house and we could run Khan Academy together? And he said, no, I, I think I'm going to go it alone. But this is a guy who just makes educational videos. And I think the future textbooks are going to be video textbooks that, that, that are going to be interactive. And some of it's going to be the content that Tyler is creating. But this is an example where, you know, he didn't know he wanted to become a YouTuber uh, and he could have become uh, um, uh, a professor and, and, and help thousands. Uh, but now uh, that he's gone this route and using the, the YouTube uh, model and the TED uh, type talk model uh, he's impacting millions yeah that is incredible this is dory clark and we are here with our weekly newsweek interview show better our guest is john werner john is the co-founder of tedx boston and we're talking about how to give a successful tedx talk john we also want to just say hello to some of the great friends tuning in from around the world to join us ryan's here from washington state we've got jay from atlanta hylton is here from brazil ashley's joining us and elizabeth anna from new hampshire todd from new york cynthia from la we've got magdalena from argentina 
Diaz here from Durham, North Carolina. We've got uh, Alessandra from Brazil. Vivek is joining us. We've got Gail from Miami. Mohammed is here, etc. We love having every single one of you. We are coming into the last part of our talk, uh, John, and I just want to ask a couple of quick fire questions for you. If you are receiving an application for somebody to speak for a TEDx talk, what's the number one mistake that people make? What is the thing that people sometimes do in their pitch that is an immediate no that, that we want to make sure people are aware of? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's a good question because there, there are thousands of um, 10X licenses. And I think realize that, that the decision maker is the person with the license. And, and a lot of times, um, that varies on what their agenda is, why they're doing the TEDx. I mean, some people, uh, they do the TEDx because they want to sign out the Sydney Opera House of their city, and they just want to show that they can throw a big event at a, um, at a, at a landmark venue, and they don't necessarily uh, uh, curate the same way, uh, the speakers. Uh, uh, um, I, I think understanding the, the agenda of the, uh, the organizer, like, um, uh, I think... Um, so you asked about mistakes. Uh, I think some people say, look, I've given this many other TED Talks. You got to pick me. And I think some curators maybe don't want to have someone that's already given a bunch of TED Talks. Um, the, the, the flip side of that is there may be some people that if you've given other TED Talks, that means that, that people like you and committed to you and that that, that may be. Um, so understand the person who's doing the curating. Uh, you know, is, is that going to be a plus or, or, or a minus? Um, I personally, in my habit, I like to go find people and say, you know, do you have an idea? Would you like to give a TED talk? And I remember this one guy, he, uh, I, I was bowling in, in Western mass and, and there were these beautiful bowling balls. I said, Hey, you know, what, what's this about? And they, they pointed to this guy and said, you know, he, he created them. And so I went up to him and said, you know, you create bowling balls. I didn't even know that was a thing. I said, you know, will you, will you please give a talk on the science of bowling and the technology of, of making these balls and the art and the design of the color. And he said, sure. And then I started talking to him more and he had um, been in the Coast Guard uh, around the Aleutian Islands. He had been shot as a cab driver. Uh, He's a very interesting guy. He was a recovering alcoholic. Um, and I learned that he had the world record in the boomerang. And so suddenly the talk all became about the, the science of boomerangs and, and all that. So uh, as a curator, I like to go, go find people. I collect interesting people and, and, um, and put them together. And, and you had mentioned something about themes. I am doing this planetary um, uh, stewardship theme. But for years, my theme was just imagination in action or ideas in action. And I, I wanted to be open to all things. I, I think some curators get so caught up on a theme that they um, they take away some of the uh, the, the range that they, they could have. Uh, so for years, I really didn't have a theme. My theme was like, you know, I, I can put anything on, on stage. Um, so I, I guess you want things to be helpful to your, uh, yeah. I think don't give a talk unless you're really ready to give a talk. Like make sure you have something to say. I think getting getting up there and trying to say something um, when it's not, when it's kind of half baked or, or it's not, it's not real, I think is a, you're, you're kind of blowing an opportunity. Uh, I also think being power, being vulnerable, telling things that are counterintuitive, uh, really think about what's in it for the audience. I think a lot of Ted talks make the mistake of, of just going off on how knowledgeable they are on something and not make it relatable. Um, but I think Ted's a great, it, I'm so thankful for the Ted platform and the Ted network and, uh, I think it's it's changed a lot of people's lives. It's it's given uh, it's democratizing uh, the spreading of ideas. Absolutely. Well, John, you have incredible longevity as a curator and co-creator of TEDx Boston. Uh, you have brought to the world thousands of talks. I'm really appreciative for the opportunity to uh, to have been uh, two of them. And so again, if folks want to check out the TEDx talk that I did for John last fall, uh, just go to doryclark.com slash TED. It'll take you there uh, to the talk. About I, actually, Dory, you just made me think of saying when, oh, yeah. one thing, when I commit to a speaker and support them and produce their talk, 
I feel like I have a special connection to them and, and you being one of them. And, and I really um, welcome hearing nominations from past speakers because I feel like they appreciate the experience. And, you know, I think you've sent me a number of wonderful people. So one advice is if you want to get into a, a TED program, maybe go find a former speaker and say to them, hey, you know, do you like me? Do you think I have something to offer? You know, do you mind going back to the program that you were part of? I, I know that would work with me uh, as opposed to someone um, pitching me uh, like having a PR agency reach out to me and say, this is why you need to pick this, this person. Uh, I'd much rather hear from someone that, that, that I've worked with. Um, and I am going to try to make the Oscars of Boston around climate change and want to create one of the top 10 uh, events. And we're, we're, we're doing it right at the same time that COP27 is going to happen in Egypt uh, in November. But I also um, am going to plan to do an event at a, a charter school in Dorchester um, uh, uh, annually. And I want to curate uh, people who are craftsmen or, or, or who help help our cities run, uh, carpenters, plumbers, uh, Uber drivers. I want to get not necessarily people with all the pedigree of, of Ivy League and PhDs. I want to get the, 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 the unsung heroes of, of our community. Uh, I haven't come up with a word for it. I, I think blue collar jobs is, is a little limiting and, and, is a, and is a little loaded as a, as a, as a title, but, um, you know, if I could ask you for some help or anyone listening, if you have some ideas for that. But I think TED is such a special platform. And uh, I think it would be good uh, uh, not only to, to double down on climate change related stuff and solutions, but uh, give a voice to the people that help run our cities. That's amazing. I love I love the creativity that you put into every event. We've been here with John Werner. He, again, is the co-founder of TEDx Boston. You can learn more about his work. Just go to TEDxBoston.com. Thank you all for tuning in. And John Werner, thank you for being here. Great. And read every one of Dory's books. They're uh, the gospel of Go Dory. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care and see you all next week.